Welcome to episode 13 of Real Life, Real Gospel. I'm your host, Josh Laborious, and this podcast is sponsored by St. Paul Lutheran Church and School in Boca Raton, Florida. This week, we're going to be talking about Christians and mission, and that's uh, our topic courtesy of the Red Letter Challenge. This is our last week of the Red Letter Challenge, so I will be shifting next week back to listener topics. So if you have anything that you would like me to discuss that you would like to have addressed um, as far as Christian living and what that looks like, what the reality of our faith is and how that plays out in the real world, uh, please comment on any of our YouTube videos, on any of our podcast feeds, wherever you might find them, or email me directly. You can do that, vicar at Um Because typically, in case this is your first listen to the podcast, what I will do is I take a topic that has been suggested by someone, or in this case is from the Red Letter Challenge, and I do my best to look at what it, how that applies to reality and just regular daily living. So uh, part of my effort to make that connection is I do avoid theological language as best I am able. I avoid academic language, and I really I do my best to simply apply this to how we live our lives. Um, that's not to say that I am not going to lay out some challenges, especially in this podcast. I, I think I'm going to be challenging quite a few of you, but I try to do so in such a way that is grounded in reality. So this week's topic is mission. As I, as I mentioned before, this is a really close topic to my heart. Um, you see, I think this is one of the foundational kind of aspects of the Christian faith. We are called into mission. That is an inescapable call. If you think you have an excuse that exempts you from mission, this is going to be a really tough podcast for you, if I'm being honest. Um, and it just drives me insane when we put our priorities on something else. <laughs> Whether that be as a church or as individuals, or as a faith, we, we put our emphasis on things that really are secondary. And we're, we're going to get into what I mean by that as we go forward. And I think part of this is, is almost a defense mechanism. Because mission can be intimidating, it can be scary, and it looks different for different people. And that's why it, it is so difficult. And what I want to start this off with is there is no excuse Mission may look different for you, but your personality, your disposition, or anything else you've got, it doesn't excuse you from having to reach out with the gospel. If you are a Christian, this is a part of your faith. This is a part of what you are called to. So with that, we're going we're gonna to just dive straight into this episode, Real Mission, Real Gospel. And I want to start very early in scripture this week as, as I approach this topic through our scripture lessons, and the first reading I want to take from Genesis 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So, some textual notes for you. Abram, who later becomes Abraham, is one of the patriarchs of Israel. He's one of kind of the the founding fathers of Israel. Um, And he has a profound relationship with God. He speaks with God on a regular basis. God speaks with him. He entertains messengers from God. It's... It's uh, it's an incredibly close relationship. Um, and this, what we see here in this passage from Genesis, this is God's promise to Abraham. He is blessed so that he might be a blessing, so that all the families of the earth will be blessed. So those are the textual notes that I have for you. And you may ask, well, what's this connection to mission? Well, what what I want to pull out from this passage is that God has consistently called his people to bless the world. 
We see that right here in Genesis. This is not New Testament. This is not Jesus. This, well, as far as Jesus is not a direct subject here. Abram is being called to be a blessing to the world around him, to all the families of the earth. God isn't making exceptions here. He's not saying only to this kind of people, only to this group, only to this area. He's saying, you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And this is back when Israel was God's chosen people. When, when Israel was on an elevated status above all others. When God, God's people didn't extend necessarily beyond that. He was still calling Abram to be a blessing to everyone. And that's kind of where I want to start our mission discussion. Is that God's people are consistently called to be a blessing to others. And we learn some stuff about God here and about the character of God here. The first is, he's not so much concerned with the comfort of his people. It starts off with him telling Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house. He, he's separating Abram from everything he's known, and he's not shying away from that at all. So as we say, mission might make us a little uncomfortable... What I see here is a God who sends us forward anyway. And then what else we learned about God is that he's comfortable in telling his people to go out and to go out into the unknown. And then finally we learn that he gives blessings with the intent that they would be shared. God does not bless us so that we can hold on tightly to our blessings and, and keep them to ourselves and protect them at all costs. He gives his people blessings so that they might be shared. He is generous in that way. So you might ask, well, this is this is spoken to Abraham. This is written to Old Testament uh, Israelites. What is the application to us? Well, there's this reality that we are in a covenant with God. It's a new covenant. It's different from the one Abram entered into. But we are blessed like Abram was, and we are called to be a blessing to the world around us. So as we finish up uh, looking at Genesis quick, what I want to do is bring out this reality that we are called to go out. And God consistently throughout the history of the Bible is a God who calls his people to go out. And something else I want to kind of pull out from this is this reality. He does say, those who dishonor you, I will curse. And yeah, we can we can take that with a vengeful attitude of uh, if someone dishonors us, God will curse them. And that's, I guess, something. But I don't think that's the attitude that we, we should be taking from this. I think what we should take from this is that our, is, it is our responsibility to represent God well. To represent God in such a way that as far as it be with us, as far as it is up to us, people have no reason to dishonor us. We, we are doing our best to make sure people do not curse us because we know that they in turn will be cursed by God. So while some people might see this more as a, a vengeful pen, uh, kind of thing, um, I see this more as an encouragement for us as God's people to go out in such a way that as many people as possible are blessed rather than cursed. So that's the reality of what comes out of this passage. And the gospel here is it is all about love for neighbor. We are blessed to be a blessing. And what's awesome is that God goes with Abram. So we see a God who walks with his people even as he challenges them. So I think we can take a lot of comfort in that because that promise is also consistent throughout scripture. God promises to be with us, his people. And that's something that takes us directly into our gospel for today. And uh, 
if you are a member at St. Paul, if you watch our live streaming services, you heard me preach on this this past weekend. And there's going to be a little bit of repetition here, but not a lot. So I would encourage you keep on listening. And if you haven't seen that service, seen that sermon, or if you're missing the opportunities to worship that you normally have in person, go ahead, uh, check out St. Paul's YouTube page. And we live stream services every Wednesday, uh, twice on Sunday, one one traditional, one com- contemporary. Plus, we have Bible studies, we have chapel services for the kiddos, and uh, this podcast, of course. So, shameless plug. Moving forward, we're going to get into Matthew 28, where it says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. So textual notes, this is a command to the disciples that we're stepping in on. This is after the resurrection, and this is Jesus telling the disciples what they are to do going forward. And this is a command that is pretty easily extended to you and I. Because the mission didn't stop when the disciples died. It, didn't, it hasn't stopped since. This call still remains to make disciples of all nations. We, we are inheritors of this call, this command, this commission. And there are no excuses to avoid it. And I'm going to get, I'm going to focus a lot on that. If you want a a more in-depth study of the Great Commission itself, um, I would encourage you to check out the sermon from this past weekend at St. Paul. But I'm going to focus a little bit on some of the daily, the reality things that we throw up to try and avoid the Great Commission. So here are some common excuses that I want to dispel. So listen up. If you think you have an excuse... Let's see if I cover it here. So the first excuse that maybe some some pietistic theological people might use is they say, well, the Holy Spirit is the one who really creates faith. The Holy Spirit is going to work, so I don't really have to do anything. First of all, that's weak, that's bogus, and you know it. But second of all, that's cheap grace. That's the same attitude as saying, I'm forgiven no matter what, so it doesn't matter what I do. The Holy Spirit is going to work. Yes, that much is true, but that doesn't mean that we don't open ourselves up as tools. We don't go forward so that he might work through us. This call is to us. The Holy Spirit was around when Jesus and the disciples walked to the earth. And Jesus knew about the Holy Spirit. Jesus knew that the Holy Spirit created faith. He was aware of all these things, and he still sent the disciples out. So that kind of tells us that we should go out. Even though we know the Holy Spirit's doing work, we should be his tools in the world. So the the next excuse I wanted to spell is kind of the other end of a spectrum. And that is this idea, I don't have the right words, or I don't know enough. I can't share my faith because I, I don't have strong enough faith. And this is something I, I want to reassure you a little bit. First of all, I think that is kind of an excuse, but I, I think it's a sincere one. I think there is a fear that, like, what if I get asked a question I don't know the answer to? So, what I want to say is the Holy Spirit works through imperfection. I had a professor at the seminary who once told a a story to us. He said that he had gone door to door evangelizing, like you, you sometimes hear about, you may have done, you may have seen, where you literally, you just go up to a door, knock on the door, and talk to people about Jesus. And he recalled one specific encounter where he left the encounter thinking, I said, all the wrong things. And this was a seminary professor. He knows his doctrine. He knows, quote unquote, the right things to say. And he left this house and he said, I said all the wrong things in all the wrong ways. 
But fast forward to the next Sunday, he saw that family in church. And they became regular attenders. They came to faith through his wrong words. So I want to uplift you. Even if you don't have the right words, the Holy Spirit can work through imperfection. You don't need a doctorate to share the gospel. Now, should we seek to know more, to be able to answer more and more questions? Yes. That's like one of the main reasons I do this podcast is to help people answer questions. But you don't have to have all the answers. If you know that Jesus loves you and loves the people you're talking to, that is good enough. The only thing I would encourage you on this front is be willing to say, I don't know. Don't make something up that someone has to unlearn later. Because there's something to be said for being honest enough to say, I don't know. So that's the next kind of excuse that I want to dispel. And then the last one that I have is it's just not me. It's not my personality to go out and share the gospel. It's not, it's not who I am. I'm I'm more comfortable with the people that I already know that are like me. Suck it up is my response to this one. Suck it up, buttercup too bad. Like, yeah, we're all more comfortable in our own group, with our own people that believe the same things we do. That's human nature. We're called to go out anyway. And if it makes you a little uncomfortable, if it's a little scary, get over it. Face your fears. Pray about it. Be confident that the Holy Spirit goes with you and go out. And yes, this may look different. If you are not a a big social person, if you don't like going out to parties and talking to strangers, that's fine. Have friends. Be active in the circles you are a part of. If all you do is sit at home and play video games and you party up with people, while you're waiting in the lobby between rounds, share the gospel with them. Like, I don't care who you are or what you do. You interact with people at some point in your life. Share the gospel with them. And and that's what I have for you. Um... So the, I guess, follow up to this is, well, how do I go about this? You say it looks different for everybody. How do I figure out what it looks like for me to share the gospel, to be in mission? And there are instructional steps right here in the Great Commission. And that is, It starts off baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So we start off by baptizing them into this family. And I think there's an important reason that this is first. Because I want to think about all the things that come with baptism. It is God adopting you into his family. It is unconditional love and acceptance and forgiveness. And I think this comes first because that's what people need and crave. They want to know that people care about them and love them. And that can look very different from person to person. But showing love to the people around us and saying, you can be part of this family. And you don't have to do anything to be part of this family. And at this time, it is really hard to literally baptize people. Because we are, we, I hope at least, you are all faithfully following the social distancing guidelines and orders that have been um, publicized and handed down. But we can still make people feel part of the family. And eventually, do we want that to end up in literal baptism? Yes, of course. But for now, we can satisfy ourselves with saying, Hey, I have this family, this church family that cares for me, that loves me unconditionally. Let me invite you into that. Let me show you that care and that unconditional love. And that comes first. Because if this second part, this this second part, which is teach them to observe everything I've commanded you, if we lead with that, what it really sounds like, what the perception is, regardless of our intent, the perception is you can be part of this group unconditionally that loves you and forgives you and cares for you, but only after you have your life together. And that's not the case. You're part of the group unconditionally. And then because we care for people, we say, Here's everything Jesus was and did and taught. 
So after we show people they are part of a group that loves and cares for them unconditionally, then we move forward into teaching them about what Jesus said and taught. Other things don't take priority. We don't say, well, we're going to wait on this group until we get these things straight. No one is excluded for thinking the wrong thing or not looking right. We're all broken sinners. God forgives all of us of our sins. So we can we can lead off with that caring and loving. And order is so order is important here and we mess that up a lot, I think. Because we love the law. We love to condemn other people because somehow I think it makes us feel better. And that's not what we're called to. We're called to bring people into the family and then teach them what Jesus taught because we care about them. So there's this reality. We are called to be in mission. We can't avoid this call. It can be uncomfortable. It's difficult, especially if you are like me and you are a little introverted and you're not super comfortable with strangers. The reality is we're called to get past that. But the gospel is that we are part of this baptismal family that we are inviting others into. We are unconditionally loved and cared for. And if that's not something you've experienced, please reach out to me. Because I don't have to know you, but I care about you. And I love you because you're part of the family. So if if you need to feel that care, if you need to feel that love, please reach out to me. I, I would love to talk to you. I, I'd love to find out what's going in your life. I, I'd love to find out what I can pray for you for. I'd love to pray with you. Because that's part of the gospel that comes out of this. And then the reality is also that Jesus promises to go with us again. He has all authority in heaven and on earth, and he promises to be with us until the end of the age. You see, everything Jesus taught and did included a lot of grace. And that's that's what he was here for, ultimately. So, we can rest in that even when we do fail to be in mission. And then, we're going to move forward into this final section And I have two Bible passages from us, both from the letter to the Corinthians, the first letter to the Corinthians. And the first five verses that I'm going to read are from chapter 2, and then the second uh, four verses are from chapter 9. So we're going to start off, "And And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant. uh, Sorry, this is transitioning to chapter 9. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jew I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not myself being under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I might share with them in its blessings. And those are our readings that are going to be our last readings for today. So what I see these as, are are, these are missional guidelines, These, these are life guidelines from Paul writing to the Corinthians. So I want to start in that first passage. He says he knows nothing among them except Christ and him crucified. He doesn't come with lofty speech or wisdom, which I think is another call for us to remember that we don't have to be master speakers to share the gospel. But I think the other focus I want to take from this is don't focus on the peripheral stuff. The relationship that we have with Christ is ultimately the only thing that matters. Nothing else really matters. 
and maybe work on what comes from that relationship with Christ, as, as we talked about with the gospel lesson, teach what Christ taught. But we don't have to teach those things before this relationship with Christ. The priority is the relationship with Christ. And I think people really get hung up on this. I can't share the gospel with them. They believe in in X, Y, or Z. And and just some examples of, of that. Um, we might say they, they believe in evolution. I can't share the gospel with them. They, they don't believe the historical accuracy of the Bible. I can't share the gospel with them. They have this political stance. I can't share the gospel with them. They believe this. They act this way. They have tattoos. They dress funny. Their hair is dyed a different color. They're hipsters. They're millennials. They're boomers. I can't share the gospel with them. And what Paul is saying here is none of that matters. Their doctrine doesn't have to be perfect. Their beliefs, their understandings, their their approach to the world doesn't have to be perfect for us to share our knowledge of Christ and Him crucified. Don't worry about the things that you have answers for. Don't worry about all this other stuff. For, worry about Christ and Him crucified. And can we talk about the rest after that? Yes, we can have those discussions. Are those discussions worthwhile? Of all the ones I listed, yes, some of them are worthwhile. Some of them are not, but some of them are. I would encourage you, have those discussions, but only after we have the discussion about Christ and Him crucified. Only after that. Now I want to move forward to that second packet passage from Corinthians, which I think uh, the, the crucial verse, or the verse that kind of summarizes the rest of it, is, uh, I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. So we have this verse before us, and I want to talk about what it looks like to become all things to all people. And I think the core of this is a flexibility of what we look like, of what we sound like, of what language we use. Whether that is literal language or dialect or cultural language. And how we go through doing all these things. And to be more blunt, what am I talking about? I'm talking about worship styles. I'm talking about how we sing, how we worship, how we uh, convey information, our social media presence, the, the different ways we're getting the word out to people. Become all things to all people means if, if someone needs us to do things a different way so we can reach them with the gospel, then by all means we ought to do things a different way to reach them with the gospel. Our traditions, our styles, our preferences, none of those are more important than the message of Jesus Christ. Okay? Just, they're not. If we insist on worshiping a certain way or dressing a certain way or living a certain way, out of preference, out of opinion, out of stylistics, ideas and that keeps someone out of the kingdom of God I think we've just made a sacrifice that I'm not willing to make and I hope I pray that you aren't either so that's I think when it means to be all things to all people I think it's a flexibility in in how we go forward into the world and the other thing I want to take with this is we shouldn't be getting too tied up with identities that are outside of Christ whether that be a political identity, or a denominational identity, or a racial identity, or a social identity. All of these different identities that are separated from Christ, if, if we cling to those more than we cling to the gospel, I think our priorities are out of order. If we say, I can't share the gospel with them, they're a Democrat, or I can't share the gospel with them, they're a Republican... 
our priorities are completely out of whack. If we say, I can't work with them because they're from another denomination, that's dumb. Get out into the into the world with the gospel. I don't care who you have to work with. Now, are those denominational differences worthwhile? Are they worth a discussion? Are they important for a reason? A lot of times, yeah, they are. And I'm not saying abandon your confession of faith. I'm not saying change what you believe. I'm saying we can still work with people, even if they believe differently than we do. We can work with people who look differently than us. We, we can work with people who are at different places in society than we are. We're called to, to work with people, to meet people where they're at, not force them to come to where we are. So, I guess a, a summary of what I'm pulling from Corinthians here is this reality that we are called to put a priority on the gospel over anything else that we connect with it. And a lot of the things that we cling to, that we make as qualifiers for our mission, for our faith, they're not worth it. The only thing worth clinging to is Christ and Him crucified. But the gospel here is that the gospel does go out, no matter what, and it goes out to us. Yes, it goes out to people who need to be reached with the gospel for the first time, or for another first time. But it reaches out to us too. We are worth reaching out to. Christ reached out to you and to me. He became us. He became humanity. Paul talks about, I am all things to all people. Christ was all things to us. With all of our wrong ideas and our messed up practices, he came to us anyway. He showed us love. He gave us forgiveness. So the summary of this entire episode is is pretty simple. Go out in mission. There's really no excuse to not go out in mission. The focus is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And that is the priority. I think that's a pretty simple summary. Um, this has been the 13th episode of Real Life, Real Gospel. Uh, Real Mission, Real Gospel. I hope that this has been helpful. If you need help brainstorming ideas of how to live out in mission even now in the midst of the quarantine, please reach out. Uh, again, I would commend to you the sermon from this past weekend at St. Paul Lutheran Church and School in Boca Raton, Florida, because I talked about a lot of those strategies there. Um, and go out in peace and serve the Lord wherever you are. Thanks be to God.